live from Dublin and around Ireland. Theatre takes centre stage. Streaming live and focusing on the issues. The art, the craft, the makers. News, hot topics and artist features. From theatremaker.ie Tonight we'll be talking to actor-writer Kate Gilmore, who appeared in Rock Magic's The Train at the Abbey Theatre and The Great Gatsby at The Gate. She will be joined by Tom Morin, an actor, writer and performer, who appeared in the runaway smash hit Copperface Jack's the musical. We will be talking about the emerging musical theatre scene in Ireland. We'll then be joined by Brian Burroughs, an actor-director known for Beowulf, the blockbuster, and Fiona Brown, an actor-singer who can currently be seen in Normal People. Both were members of the cast of Angela's Ashes the Musical, Finally, we'll be speaking to actor and singer Brian Gilligan. Brian has an illustrious career as a musical theatre performer throughout Ireland and the UK. We will be talking about making work for the world's biggest stages. Also on tonight's show, Simon Delaney, Connor Mitchell and Benedict Esdale and William Dunleavy. Okay. In for Amy Kidd, I'm Kelly O'Doherty, and this is Stage Door Live for the 22nd of July, 2020. Welcome back to Stage Door Live, episode 15. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in for every episode, and welcome to anyone joining us for the first time tonight. And a massive, massive thank you to everyone who has been uh, ch checking out our Patreon and keeping chatting to us on social media. We love hearing from you. We've got an exciting show this evening. Along with our fabulous lineup of guests, we'll have a very special musical appearance from Amy O'Dwyer at the end of the show. Let's take a look at the news. No prompter. Where's my prompter? The Connacht Tribune has reported that Gardaí and Galway are investigating the alleged theft of high-value theatre equipment from the terminal at Galway Airport. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, Branagh Theatre de Fosdi had been running Shruna Changa, an immersive theatre production at the airport terminal in early March. After its run was cut short, a COVID-19 drive-through testing centre was set up at the terminal and although access has been severely restricted, a number of items were missing when the company returned to retrieve them. Anyone with information is encouraged to phone the Galway Garda station at 091 538 000. We'll include that phone number in our show description later tonight. In coronavirus news, Researchers at the University of Oxford have announced that the first human trials of a vaccine in development have yielded promising results. Although it's still too early to say whether or not this will offer protection, larger scale trials involving 30,000 people are now, underway this develop, are now underway. This development offers some hope for a quicker return to normal activity. Here in Ireland, phase three of the roadmap to, uh, to opening has been extended until August the 10th, and the Minister for Health has said that if we reach 100 new cases per day, we may need to go back to phase two. While many pubs are dismayed by the delay in reopening, performance venues hoping to reopen have received some positive news. This week, Minister Catherine Martin has announced that theatres, arts centres and venues can now apply for capital funding intended to assist in reopening under the new Stream D of the Cultural Capital Scheme 2019 to 2022. 
In addition, the Arts Council announced on Monday that they will start to accept applications to its emergency stabilisation funding, which is intended to provide once-off financial support to strategic funded and arts centre funded organisations that are in need of emergency grant aid between now and the 31st of December 2020. The Arts Council also said that as a result of the government's additional 20 million euro funding package, a wide range of other schemes and awards would be announced in the weeks ahead. These will include a capacity building scheme to support arts organisations to gain support, skills and expertise to review and adapt their artistic and or business models. An award to help artists and arts practitioners develop their skills or avail of training opportunities, project awards and commissions. In other funding news, the Minister announced on Monday a new initiative from the Creative Ireland programme through its strategic national partners and local authorities. The Creativity in Older Age programme has been designed to counteract the social side effects of the pandemic. It will begin immediately and will be rolled out over the next 18 months and will include a series of creative residencies in care facilities and a multi-arts programme as part of the Well Festival of Arts and Wellbeing and much more. And as the economic fallout of COVID-19 continues, Government plans are being finalised for the €350 Euro per week top tier of the pandemic unemployment payment to be reduced by €50 Euro per week in the autumn. The National Campaign for the Arts will host an update meeting for artists and arts workers this Friday, July 24th at 2pm with Irish Equity and Theatre Forum, which will shed some light on the tax implications of the PUP and how it may be affected by taking on work. You can register to attend that meeting at the NCFA's website, which we'll provide a link to later tonight. Also, this Friday at 3.15 p.m., there will be an Arts Council funding clinic. You can sign up to attend by emailing hannagordis at hannagordis at artscouncil.ie. In international news, the UK have given the go-ahead for indoor performances to resume from August 1st. Guidance for reopening theatres includes social distancing of performers, increased deep cleaning and reduced venue capacity. However, venues in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland will have to follow guidelines set by the devolved governments. But this announcement comes as redundancies continue to be announced across the UK, including at Edinburgh's Traverse Theatre, and stories are circulating that offstage workers may be asked to repay employer furlough contributions from their wages once shows resume. We'll keep you informed as more information comes available. Now for some programming updates. This is Pop Baby have announced they will not be in theatres for the rest of 2020 and are using this time for rest and recovery. You can still support the company while they recover by ordering a limited edition t-shirt designed by graphic artist Niall Sweeney. Even though we won't be seeing any digital work from This Is Pop Baby, there are plenty of other exciting online events this week to keep you sated. Tomorrow, the final installment of the Druid debuts An Honest Woman by Erica Murray, directed by Sarah Joyce, will be live online at 7.30. Other online festivals include Wex Wexford Opera Festival, announcing it's going online this year. Its original Shakespeare-themed programme has been rescheduled to 2021, but a free eight-day online celebrating Waiting for Shakespeare, the festival in the air, will take place the 11th to 18th of October. Friday at 7pm, Fishamble will premiere Tiny Plays 24-7, a selection of plays from their Tiny Play Challenge, which began earlier in the lockdown. The short plays will be available to view online for free, donations being welcome, and will also be available to view on YouTube the following week. Also Friday at 7.30 p.m., the Lear's second instalment of their final year Actors Shakespeare Meet Lockdown Pieces, As You Like It, free to view online, but donations can be made towards the Lear's Response Fund. Epic, event production industry COVID-19, last week announced a spectacular fundraiser, Songs from an Empty Room a live music broadcast from the Olympia Theatre Dublin 
in aid of Minding Creative Minds and Association of Irish Stage Technicians Crew Hardship Fund, which you can donate to on GoFundMe. The show will be broadcast on RTE2 TV and RTE2 FM radio on Saturday, 25th of July from 8.30 p.m. Kilkenny Arts Festival have launched their Kilkenny Arts Festival X programme. Showings will be taking place 11th to the 16th of August, viewable online, but the option to physically attend with new booking guidelines, contact tracing and other measures in place will also be possible. Finally, Dublin Youth Theatre's Big Show 2020, Zoonosis, is an online bedroom pop opera about life forms in lockdown by Cal Folger Day and directed by Tom Creed. This will be previewing the 12th of August. Zoo Zoonosis exists as an interactive website where audiences can make their own journey through our online bedroom pop opera. For four nights in August, the cast of Zoonosis will be on Zoom and bring audiences through its world. Now to finish up this week's news with some opportunities. Project Arts Centre have announced an open call for a series of three artist commissions for Future Forecast, a series of events and artistic interventions forming part of a speculative voyage towards the future. Each commission is valued at €5,000 and applications are open to artists based in Ireland. Applications closed at 12pm on Monday the 10th of August. Big Telly Theatre Company is inviting proposals from theatre makers to plan and deliver a duration piece in empty shops across Northern Ireland. Applications should be submitted before the 10th of August. And the Lear Academy are searching for a new director of marketing to join the senior management team. Applications for the position close at 5 p.m. on Friday, August 7th. As always, we'll share links to these opportunities in our episode description later tonight. And that's it for the news. If we missed anything, please do send us your press releases and suggestions to news at theatremaker.ie or slide into our DMs on social media. Don't forget to check out our associate producer's blogs every week. Hilary Dominski, the news that didn't make it, will be posting tomorrow with all the headlines that didn't make the show. If you find value in Stage Door Live, please help us grow by letting your friends and followers know. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that follow button and give us a like. Take a moment to share this live feed with your friends and followers right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and click that bell to keep updated on our new and exclusive YouTube content. Your support helps us continue these important conversations about Irish theatre now and into the future. Everyone has their favourite musical. Some are quite fanatical about it, other are, others are as passionate about it as their local hurling club. What's your favourite musical? Let us know in chat. In the meantime, we asked a few people for their thoughts on the subject. Hi, my name is Adam. I am based in Cork and I'm a massive musical theatre fan. Um, so I first got into musical theatre through Wicked, which is probably one of my all-time favourite musicals. I just love the music, I love the story, and I love the whole concept behind it. Uh, but I have to say, Waitress and Dear Evan Hansen would also be equally up there in terms of music and just staging. Um, they are fantastic musicals. Hi, my name is Julie, and my favourite musical is Next to Normal. Um, because it is a small ensemble show um, about like a suburban family and it deals a lot with mental health issues and grief and things like that so it's all really complex characters and of course the music in it is amazing as well so yeah that's my favourite musical. Um, being asked what my favourite musical is, uh, it's a tough one I find that it often changes monthly um, but at the moment, I would say my favourite musical is Dear Evan Hansen. I just, yeah, think it's an amazing musical. The music and the message of the show is just incredible. Would have to be Dogfight because the music is incredible. I think the storyline is really important. It has a really important message. 
it's um, about soldiers going into the Vietnam War and it's about them being at home just before the war and it actually has a really important message. The female lead is such a strong character and she goes through a real emotional journey throughout the whole show. And yeah, I just love it as a musical. It's fantastic. Um, I've always, always, always been a huge Wicked fan. I think that as a child, I grew up watching The Wizard of Oz and I think that they've tied the two stories together so well. I thought it was very, very clever and I adore all the songs. They're the type of songs that I like to sing and that's important for me. And the second musical, which I absolutely fell in love with last summer, was Waitress. And I just think that the emotion in it was so raw. It was a story that I'm sure loads of people can relate to. And it was funny as well. Um, funny and had moments of sadness as well, but the songs as well were beautiful. Well, there's so many to choose from. Les Mis starring Colin Wilkinson, Phantom of the Opera, Blood Brothers with Rebecca Stone, Michael Ball in Mac and Mabel, even the wonderful Irish Killian Donnelly in Memphis. So many favourites. Even my own musical society, Avon Morse, musical society here in Arco, we did a production of Evita a few years ago with Leah Penson as Ava Prawn and Chris Curd as Che, which was very special. But I suppose my favourite musical would have to be Come From Away. It tells the story of the Gander residents and the 7,000 people who are stranded from away and the story of their lives how they housed them and fed them and the relationships they built up. I'm joined now by Kate Gilmore, who appeared in Rough Magic's The Train at the Abbey Theatre and The Great Gatsby at The Gate, and Tom Morin, an actor, writer and performer who appeared in the runaway smash hit Copperface Jacks, the musical. Hello, Kate and Tom. Welcome to you both. How are you keeping? I'll go to Good you first. Uh, yeah. And, and how are you getting on, Kate? Yeah, I'm getting on really well, thanks. Wonderful. So Kate, we'll start with you. Um, you've been in quite a few musicals like Assassins and plays with music like Gatsby. Can you tell me a little bit about those shows and the differences between them or the particular challenges that were involved? Yeah, um, oh, I think being in a rehearsal room for a musical like Assassins, is a, it's, a, it's a different rehearsal room to anything else because you have you know a band on the first day you have your read through and sing through on the same day you have a musical director in a different room that's gone through songs with the performers and then a stage director in one room gone through text so it's broken up a lot uh, the work is and then you have like a sit probe before tech with everybody and the band and then tech has spent a lot of it you know gone through sound mix and stuff um and of course something like assassins is in the canon of musical theater so it's very very you can stay very loyal to the music and um, the text and obvi obviously. Um, and then something like Gatsby would have been, the songs in it were chosen by Alexander Wright and he was really laid back about allowing us to have an input into it in a more kind of organic way and you could add harmonies and a lot of the performers played instruments so that was added in. So it was kind of more laid back and chilled out. I love, to be honest, working on both of those shows and in both of those environments where, you know, the music um, like in Assassins would be absolutely integral and woven so much into the text. And then in the different scenario where the music just kind of elevates the story or sits on top of it in a kind of a more relaxed way. Um, but yeah, I love working on, 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 on anything with music, to be honest. Fantastic. It sounds like they were both very different experiences, but both equally wonderful. Yeah. And variety is the spice of life and all of that jazz. Um, so, Tom, I'll come to you now. You were in the cast of uh, the musical Fierce Notions. I love that title. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, well, Fierce Notions uh, was a, a creation of Fun, Fionn Foley, who's a, an absolute musical genius. And it was just, it was one of them shows that was such a joy to be a part of because 
um, you know, in the spirit of what we're talking about with musical theater, like it just, I think has the capacity to, I mean, first of all, bring so much joy and be very moving, but also be really subversive. And, you know, Fionn as a writer is absolutely hilarious, but he's also quite political. And yeah, it was so great to be a part of a show uh, and a small part of it that, that was so, um, yeah, so subversive and I think really snuck up on audiences. And it's one of them shows that you'll laugh the whole night, but then you'll leave with a real message, which uh, I, I think is Fionn's real skill as a writer. So it, it was one of my favorite memories on stage, to be honest. Oh, fantastic. That sounds like a skill in itself. A bit of crack, but a great message. Uh, yeah, yeah, must check out more of Fionn's work and hopefully we'll see more from him in the future. Um, Kate, can you tell me about your experience working on the train? It was such an incredible story based on true events and hit the stage at a particularly political time in Ireland. Was there a bit of pressure there? Yeah, there there was, but thankfully when I was doing it, I didn't realize, I don't think, I just didn't, I mean, I knew the story obviously inside out and I did all of the research and everything, but I, I think I just underestimated the, how big the moment was in Irish history and in, and in politics and um, how it really changed, it changed the game and um, the legislation and the real women were so brave who, who were on the contraceptive train and then Mary Robinson who did bring the legislation to the Shannon like we met those women afterwards and I think it was only when I met them that I kind of realized oh wow the pressure is on us to tell that story uh, honestly clearly efficiently um well brilliantly I suppose so yeah I'm, I'm pretty glad that I kind of only really uh, was aware of how huge it was when I met the actual real people because I think if I had known beforehand, it might have hindered like choices and things. You kind of get afraid then, you feel intimidated. You're like, oh, I'm not, I can't do this, I'm not good. So yeah, it was really, really wow. exciting to be part of something like that, yeah. Amazing that Mary Robinson was there. That must have been fantastic a opportunity to perform for such a legend, uh, knowing she was in the crowd. Mm -hmm. um, can you just, um, Kate, just to elaborate on, can, for those viewers that haven't seen the train, could you just tell us a little bit, just in one sentence about what it was about? Yeah, so um, a group of women formed the Irish Liberation Movement um, and in 1971 they went up to Belfast uh, on, and they brought back illegal contraception, um, condoms and what they told the public were the pill but it wasn't actually the pill, it was aspirin and pill bottles because they needed a prescription and they didn't know they did, they needed one. So they brought those back uh, illegally and in a protest and a lot of them were arrested and it was a huge moment because up until that point, uh, contraception had been illegal in the Republic of Ireland. So they, oh, wow. yeah, they changed that. Brilliant. That sounds fantastic. And to write a musical around that subject, it just shows you you can really have the best of both worlds. A play with a good topic yeah. accompanied by great music. Um, fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, Tom, back to you now at Copperface Jacks the musical. Uh, the show is postponed at the moment, unfortunately, but hopefully we'll be back. And it has been a huge success. Um, what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, the whole thing has been amazing. And I, I, I think one of my favourite things about the show is that the audiences that have been coming into us, while being a, a theatre audience, is probably largely not, you know, your typical theatre audience who, you know, might regularly go to the Abbey and the Gate and so many of our, our great theatres, there's something really, like, it's actually very rock and roll, the experience of Copper's the Musical, it's the closest I'll ever get to rock and roll anyway. And the whole thing has been just, uh, the, the, the word that always comes back to me for it is joyous, like people leave with this buzz that I've never seen people leave a show with before. And yeah, being a part of that, it, there's something really gratifying about it because um, I think it's one of them shows that just sort of sweeps you along with it. And yeah, I think once you sort of give yourself over to coppers, like I think it can be a very infectious night out for sure. Oh, fantastic. Well, I mean, I suppose everybody in the audience has probably been to coppers at some point or other as well. So there's a bit of nostalgia there, I'd say as well, or people who are still going to coppers. Hmm like myself every now yeah. and again, guilty pleasure, <laughs> guilty pleasure. Um, 
so let's uh, this is a question for for both of you but i'll come over to you first kate for your answer so you're both writers in your own right and though Ireland hasn't the biggest history of making musicals, there appears to be a, a surge in that direction. What kind of musicals would you like to see being created? Um, I, yeah, I think it's, the game has really changed in the last like 10 years where we're starting to kind of mix um, musical theatre and Irish storytelling and we're making homegrown proper musical theatre now with structures and um, I just love the I love the type of musical like The Train or like say Breakfast on Pluto which is coming next year because it's really easily able to satirise uh, Ireland and um, its religion politics in a, in a really loving way and a humorous way and that is something that the Irish have read really distinctly and um, that we're able to do so well, and I think when we like get into when we hook onto that and um, put it into a musical format, we'll be able to present like really, really good work that that is new and fresh and really exciting, and and it will be as fun to go and see as Matilda in the board. Gosh, you know. So yeah, I I hope and it continues from. From what I hear as well, you could be uh, someone that could write something uh, like that yourself, because didn't you write something, Kate, uh, for the theatre upstairs? Didn't you do a, a musical? You wrote one yourself. Yeah, um, myself and Lawrence Falconer wrote a, a sort of musical called A Picture of Us um, about six years ago for theatre upstairs. And it was kind of like a cardboard version of uh, the last five years. I think we really liked that uh, story. so we made a sort of a musical with what we had and the instruments that we kind of already knew that were, I mean, he, Lawrence is a great guitar player, but uh, I couldn't really play much. So I was on the xylophone and um, yeah, we- <laughs> The xylophone matters. We all love a good xylophone. <laughs> it, it adds, it adds a, a certain timbre. Um, yeah, I think we just kind of made something with what we had because at the time it was just so important for us to get it on and to show the world like the type of work we wanted to be in and see and create and make and I've said that already. So yeah, doing that was something that was like, it. we made we made something out of what we had at the time and it actually was received really well and um, yeah, I enjoyed it. So yeah, we'll have to we'll we'll hope to see more from from you yourself in the future as a writer, Kate. That sounds exciting. Um, now same question to you, Tom, and then I think we have a question from social media. So, what kind of musicals would you like to see in uh, make, coming out of Ireland? Yeah, I totally echo everything Kate said, and I think as well there's a real, I think I think there's a real sense that when you look at those big shows, whether it's Hamilton or Les Mis, there's a real there's room for the Irish version of that about like the story of like of our nation, whether it is, you know, 1916 inspired. I know there's Michael Collins, the musical, there, there's room for, for that story. There's been attempts at it with the bloody Irish and stuff and shows that just never quite got off the ground. But I think our national story does really lend itself to that. So I'd be really interested to see, you know, could we really nail that on the global scale the way shows like, you know, Les Mis or, or, or Hamilton have. But as well as that, I would love to see you know, I think this COVID time and the fact that theatre essentially isn't a thing in, in the way we knew it before because, you know, audiences being in rooms together isn't safe right now. It really uh, brings home to me the fact that I love when theatre does the thing that, like, theatre can only do. And I think musical theatre is a beautiful example of that. You know, as Kate said earlier, like, with the orchestra, with musicians, with live music, with live singing, dancing, like, that sort of thing is, is so special. So I've... From my point of view, I would just love to see the more. I, I think Irish theatre is naturally going in this way, but the more Im, it embraces it, the more theatrical it feels, and and it always is such a joy when you see theatre really maximise its capacity to to be its most special. I suppose. Yeah, fantastic. That's absolutely right. And um, so I think we have a question from social media. Um, so why do Kate and Tom think is the reason for musical theatre not being recognised as well as some of the other arts in this country? That's a brilliant question. I'll go over to you, Kate, first for your answer to that. We, um, it's kind of a, um, a loophole uh, thing because I think there, are, there aren't um, 
well, there hasn't been in the past, say, the the musicals. We haven't made musicals here um, historically. And so, therefore, there's not training for it. So we don't really have a musical theatre school here um, the way Mount View Guildhall in the UK does. And I think it's starting to change, but in a way that is very unique. And because it's only starting now, there, you know, we don't, all our musical, a lot, a lot of our musical theatre performers have gone to the UK. So we need to kind of build it from the ground up. And uh, a lot of the time we need, you know, they need trained musical theatre performers in plays and yet we don't have the training ground here. So it's like that thing of the more work we create, the more jobs will be created, the more training will be created and the more it will be recognised kind of as important as the other art forms are. Absolutely. Wouldn't that be great to get a building up over here and keep our talent uh, local and, and making work for us over here? Absolutely. Very good answer there, Kate. And for yourself, Tom? Yeah, I think it, it is a really interesting question. And I think as well, when you say musical theatre, different people will think different things. If you just ask your average punter on the street, odds are that they probably are thinking of those big West End blockbuster shows, whether that's your Wicked's or your Lion Kings or your Les Mis, whatever it is, then, um, you know, and I say this completely lovingly, but musical theatre nerds are going to think about these smaller shows, as Kate mentioned earlier, whether it's the last five years or, you know, Dear Evan Hansen, uh, Dear Evan Hansen mm -hmm. Hamilton, all these kind of shows that are, are, are now coming to the fore. But what I really think is interesting in Ireland, because we do have a smaller country, um, than, as opposed to, say, the, the West End and, and the UK for, or Broadway and New York, it's that musical theatre, generally speaking, is one of the most commercial forms of theatre, whereas um, Ireland, you know, our, our audiences, our theatre audiences, uh, and I think our commercial theatre audiences are actually quite different. I'm not sure what the overlap of people who go to the Abbey and the Gate on a monthly basis is with people who go to, for example, the Board Gosh or, or even the Gaiety or the Olympia. So I think the more and more we can see those worlds uh, merging together, and even it was so interesting last year, you know, seeing uh, the Abbey do a, a show like, you know, Come From Away and, and the way that went on to the West End. And I, I know there were complications even in that in terms of like, Irish cast members as part of it and all that sort of stuff. But the idea of those worlds uh, blending is really interesting. And I think the more we see the blending of that world, um, maybe the, the, the more integrated musical theatre will be amongst uh, the other art forms in this country that, um, yeah, that we're so, so proud of and, and so good at producing. Absolutely. Um, that's a fantastic answer as well, Tom. And there's plenty of food for thought there. Um, and thank you so much to both of you for joining us this evening on Stage Door Live. You have been lovely guests. And now you can go away and get yourselves a cup of tea and watch the rest of the show. <laughs> lovely. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Thank Cheers. See you, Kate. Bye. Bye. I had the pleasure of chatting with Simon Delaney earlier this week. Most of you will recognize Simon from presenting on Ireland AM. And who could forget him in the brilliant Bachelor's Walk? His career spans both the big and small screens, the stage, and more recently, the kitchen. From The Conjuring 2 on film to The Snapper at the Gate and The Full Monty on stage, this man has done and seen it all. Let's jump right into our conversation now. So Simon, you have worn many hats over the years. You've been an actor, director, writer, producer, and presenter. Do you have mm -hmm. a favorite or do you like that it's varied? I think I think it's the current gig that you're doing at the time. That's the one that becomes your favorite because it's the one you're focused on. I remember doing a film years ago with Sir Michael Gambon and asking him that exact question about whether he preferred, you know, in terms of acting, whether he preferred theater or film. And he answered and he said, and that was very true. He said, when you're on set and you're on set for 14, 16 hours a day and you're bored hanging around, you wish that you were doing a theatre show where you just had to go in for a couple of hours at night. And then on the flip side, when you're in theatre and you're doing the same show every night, eight shows a week, you're wishing, God, yeah. I wish I was on a film set. So <laughs> I think it depends on whatever the job is you're doing at the time. That's the one you're focused on. But I think an actor's home is on stage, you know, a director's home, yeah. 
is behind the lens, but an actor's home is on stage. That's the one we all love doing the most. Absolutely. And uh, you have had a lot of experience in musicals, and that's obviously what we're talking about this week on Stage mm. Door Live. Um, so what for you makes what for you makes musicals so popular in Ireland? Um, you know, I think I think as a genre, it's it's probably my favourite form of theatre um, because I think it's just pure and utter escapism. I mean, you know, we hear this age old adage that a, mus a piece of music can take you somewhere. Um, you know, if we hear a piece of music from our childhood or it, it, it creates a memory of when we were younger, there's something about live music. Um, and I'm talking about concerts or operas, but just there's something about being in a room and hearing an orchestra strike up. And I think then when you add on top of that a good book, um, be it a drama or a comedy, uh, there's nothing quite like it. I mean, it's the escapism thing, but I think it's just attacks all senses uh, with the live yes. music. And uh, for me, it's uh, it's the purest form of theatre. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I completely agree with you. You know, every time I've gone to see a musical, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the only times that I ever feel like I get complete goosebumps when, when yeah. a song strikes up and the band strikes yeah. up or the orchestra. Um, so why do you think then, Simon, that sometimes there can be a little bit of snobbery towards musicals? I think it's, I think when people say to you, I don't like musicals, I, I just think, I always say to them, well, you haven't seen the right ones. You know, I mean, if you go back to Hollywood's heyday, you know, where they turned out, the majority of, of film that they turned out were musicals um, because that's what the audiences wanted. Uh, you know, I think that might have given musicals a bad name. But if you go back and look at the back catalogue of the classics, the now classics like Showboat, Oklahoma, Calamity Jane, they're great movies, but they're also great musicals. And I think... Moving forward, then you know there, there were some musicals that were that were ahead of their time, and I think the greatest musical ever written, and my favourite West Side Story, <clears throat> is an example of a perfect piece of theatre. I mean, if somebody says to you, "I don't like musicals," well, sit them down and watch, let them watch West Side Story because it's based on the greatest love story ever told, uh, Rome, Romeo and Juliet, and it has probably the greatest score, musical score ever written. There isn't a bad note of music in the show. Um, no. So I think it's a case of us having to <clears throat> re-educate the audiences, particularly people who say they don't like musical theatre. But if you look at the product over the last maybe 15 years in in Ireland and in the West End and Broadway, you know, a lot of it's jukebox musicals. You look at the, you know, a lot of movies that are turned into musicals, The Bodyguard, stuff like that. Um, and again, people might think, no, not for me. But I think they just need to give it a chance. I mean, you can find yeah. a genre, a subject that you like, and you'll yeah. probably find a musical about it. I mean, musical theatre for me can make you can make you laugh and can make you cry. And that's what theatre is about. Absolutely. Absolutely. A, a full on experience, a, a yeah. roller coaster of emotion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Definitely. So um, there's been a, a massive increase in formal theatre training in Ireland in the last number mm. of years. Um, have you seen a change in the industry here that reflects that? Um, I have. I mean, I you know, I always feel like a bit of a a bit of a cheat when I'm talking about formal theatre training because I had none. Um, I've never had a day's training in my life when, it, when you know, in terms of acting. But I mean, I've been an ambassador at the Lear Theatre for, or the Lear Academy, I should say, for a number of years, and and I see it myself when I'm on the other side of the casting table when I'm directing, just the standard of of people who are coming into the room to audition. Um, you know, back in the day, I think particularly with musical theatre, you know, if you had any grow or ambition towards a career in musical theatre, you know, you had to get on a plane and you had to go and study in London or elsewhere. Yeah. Now there are various courses that you can do here that are becoming recognised as, you know, renowned qualifications. So that's a great start. I think we need more of it here. I think we need... Yeah. Uh, I think we need to spe specialise more in musical theatre because, you know, the West End outsells Hollywood, you know, the West End and Broadway, yeah. the product, musical theatre, it's a very, very, it's a high revenue stream when it comes to the entertainment business. And I think we should take a little bit more, uh, be a little bit more aware of it, of that here in Ireland because we have the talent, we have the actors, we have the writers. Uh, and I think to nurture that, 
we need to develop a little bit more homegrown musical theatrical studies. Uh, so we give our students a chance to develop here instead of having to up sticks and move to London, live away from home for a couple of years and then try and play their trade. If they can leave here with the qualification and then hit London and then hit the US, that would help. Absolutely. It would be nice to keep some of us here, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. Definitely. And you're so right about musicals, you know, outselling Hollywood. And hopefully, you know, after all this, I'd say everybody would be ready for a musical. What do you think, Simon? I think well, this is everyone... it. I mean, see, the, I think the problem is, Kelly, that, that uh, you know, there's a huge, there's no doubt that there's a huge appetite for musical theatre here. You only have to look at what the Board Gosh Energy Theatre has done in since its arrival you know it was built with a specific reason it was built to take in the product the west end of broadway product and the audiences flock to it now some actors would say it's a great initiative but it's not providing a lot of work for irish actors and irish performers because it's a touring house so a lot of shows yeah. would just drop in um, and that is true but what it does prove is that the that the the audience is here for it. So that should tell yeah. people and theatres around the country that, you know what, maybe if we want to fill our theatres, maybe we should put a couple of more musicals in there, but cast them locally, yeah. cla cast them yeah. within. And I don't just yeah. mean actors, I mean musicians, you know. Yeah, um, maybe that will help because I think theatrical theatre producers will tend to shy away from musical because they're so bloody expensive to put on. Yeah, um, they are spectacles and they, they are, are that's part and parcel I mean, of it. You know, if you put an orchestra into a theatre, that's expensive. You know, it doesn't matter what the musical yeah. is, it's expensive, yeah. you know, and then you add in choreography on top of that, uh, dancers, choreographer, you know, and then your normal expenses, you've got your cast, your lighting, your costume, sound. They're expensive to run, but Cameron McIntosh wouldn't be running musicals if there wasn't money in them, and he is. No, yeah, exactly. Well, on that note, what what mm. makes a good musical, in your opinion? I think it's just got to be a, a musical that moves you and it moves you to tears, either through comedy or through tragedy. Um, you know, some of the best musicals I've seen are comedies. I saw Dirty Rotten Scoundrels on Broadway, um, Avenue Q. I remember seeing the original cast of that on Broadway. And probably one of my favourites, I already touched on West Side Story, but The Producers is one of the greatest musicals I think <laughs> ever written. Yeah, that's a classic. Be a classic it is. Yeah. Uh, and please God, it's a role that I'd love to play before I shuffle out this mortal coil. I'd yeah. love to have a go at Max Bialystok. <laughs> but oh, there's I'd so go many good that. ones. I'd definitely would go you? to see that. I would, absolutely. <laughs> but, so would the whole country, Simon. But We'd be all there. But you know what? I love, I love the classics too, Kelly. I love uh, Fiddler on the Roof. It's a great show. Um, and I love the, I love some of the big old, old musicals. And then some of the contemporary ones, maybe not so contemporary, but The Hired Man is a gorgeous piece of musical theatre. Um, and that's one that, I haven't seen you know, that one, actually. I haven't seen it's, that It's one. an incredible piece. And you know what? It's a piece of musical theatre that a lot of the amateur groups uh, put on uh, for a number of reasons. The, the cast is split, so there's a nice... Uh, balance between male and female parts, but also it's only a four piece orchestra. So it tends to be handy on the budget, but the okay. musical score is, is incredible. The story is incredible. So I mean, in terms of what makes a good musical, it, it, it can be anything, you know, it can be absolutely anything. Some of the greatest musicals have, have very little dialogue in them. So the book doesn't have to be a huge part, but it's about the score. And then flip that, there's some other musicals where it's all about the book and the music is just an underscore. So yeah, anything really, absolutely. but whatever moves you, whatever moves yeah. you. Yeah. So if you okay are going to say see West Side Story, <clears throat> one of one of your mm. favorites, are you able to now switch off and enjoy it, or do you ever kind of find yourself <laughs> analyzing it and thinking, oh, I would have done that now a bit differently? Yeah. Well, like, so look, uh, actors yeah. do that anyway. You know how many actors does it take <laughs> yeah. to change a light bulb? A hundred and one, one to do it, and a hundred to say I could have done that better. <laughs> But now it's, I find it hard sometimes to sit there and think, <clears throat> to not critique it. But what I tend to do now and have done over the last 10 years or so is I'll tend to take an attitude of, I'm going to go here and try to learn something. And, you know, I go and try and watch a musical to see what the director might be doing with it. 
And I, I, I love when I'm sitting there and I go, geez, I never thought of that. That's a great way of staging that. What a lovely idea. I find myself doing that rather than going, no, I didn't like her. Now she was a bit flat when she came to that big area. That doesn't interest me. Um, <laughs> we could all take a leaf tend- out of your book then, Simon. <laughs> well, well, you try it as best you can, you know. I mean, actors yeah. are a terrible audience anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, um, we all know that when we come to preview yeah. plays and, and the audience is filled with uh, – theatrical students and you think Christ this is going to be a hard house you know what I mean because they're all sitting there going well I auditioned for it and I didn't get us this is awful <laughs> you know yeah. I don't know what he's doing that I didn't do in the audition <laughs> oh that's so so true so yeah. true um, <laughs> but yeah there, I suppose there seems to be um, an exciting new landscape of Irish made <clears throat> musical theatre yeah. emerging from like you have Angela's Ashes and then on the other yeah. side you have Copperface Jacks the musical which was huge yeah. and did so and well and you have the likes of um, Michael Collins in there as well I think it's important that we do musicals that people want to see and I think that's a general rule when it comes to theatre um, you know, there is time and a place for what I would describe as high art. Um, but at the end of the day, particularly now, um, audiences are key. In other words, income is key. Um, and again, going back to amateur musical theatre, which is where I started, we used to always complain every year when we'd gather in the hall to hear what show the committee had chosen. And when they mentioned Oklahoma, and we went, all went, Jesus, can we not do something modern? And we used to always say, why do you keep picking Oklahoma and Greece? And, and they're saying, because they fill the hall, because they fill the theatre. Because yeah. if we don't fill the theatre, we're not doing a play later on in the year. And we won't be doing a panto at the end of the year. Um, yeah. So I think we have to be careful in terms of what we put on. But again, go back to something I said earlier on. There's no doubt about it that the talent is here. And not just actors, uh, writers, musicians, composers. They're all here. We have them in abundance. Yes. And they need supporting. And that is what I would say regional theatre is for. And, you know, the M50 circuit, the Driox, uh, yes. the Civic. You know, we need to give these spaces over to to Irish creative people uh, and see their new product. Because, you know, in the States they have a system where a show won't go, obviously won't go direct to Broadway. It'll trial in Connecticut. It'll trial in Canada before it goes in. So make those shows or make those theatres the spaces for our trials. Trial new stuff. Put it on for a week somewhere. Um, the likes of Copperface Jacks, nobody thought that, that was going to work. Phenomenal success. Yeah. Really about to go into its third year of a run. Um, Michael Collins, written by the late, great Brian Flynn. Phenomenal show. That show needs to be on a stage in the West End or on Broadway. Nobody can tell me that American Broadway audiences wouldn't lap up Michael Collins. Of course they would. Absolutely. Um, so Irish we need to, history we need to, is very important. Yeah. Well, we need to use the spaces that we have available to promote Irish art, artists, Irish creatives, places like the Axis and Ballymun, who are phenomenal at, doing, phenomenal at doing things like that. Those spaces need to be utilised, but then again, we need to be careful that the stuff that we put on is going to make people want to come into the theatre and spend their money. So if people, I mean, it's a, it's a good time, I suppose, for people to get their heads together and start creating stuff like that for exactly. when people are ready to get back into the theatres. Because I, I know I miss it. I miss going into the theatre desperately. So I'll be mm-hmm. ready for something something beautiful and, and, and new to cheer me up when I get back. Well, look, the it's the one thing that's carried us all through this mayhem and madness of COVID has been the arts because we were all told to stay yes. at home. The first thing we did was switch exactly. on the TV. And what were we watching? We're watching creative people yeah. do what they do. We, we've kept the world going for the last five Absolutely. months. So if yeah. and when we do get back to doing what we do, they'll come back and support us. Of course they will. Last last question for you, Simon. And My uh, favourite colour is red, Kelly, just in case that's the last question. <laughs> Was that it oh, today? Son, my son will be delighted to hear that because he's been asking everyone their favourite colour. That's his interview question of the moment well, is what's your favourite colour? it's red. Color, so. I hope it's the right answer. But what's your last question, Kelly? (laughs) My last question is, do you have any advice for any burgeoning actors, writers, directors out there? What could you say to them to to keep them going? Don't do it. Go and get a trade. (laughs) Learn how to be a plumber or a carpenter. Don't do it. Now, what I would say to them is, um, 
you know what? It's a very, very, very tough way to make a living. Um, you need uh, determination. You need, although you might think it, you need a bit of a business brain on you because it is a business. The clue's in the title. It's called show business. Um, you need the right people around you. Um, but you also need, uh, you need to be a dreamer, I think. You need to be willing to jump off the cliff now and again uh, because we all face that point in our lives where I know for me, I was doing amateur music and theatre and I was doing more of it and more of it and more of it and I had a job and I came to a point when I was 26 and I thought, right, I have to either give this a go or forget about it. And what I didn't want to become was that 50-year-old sitting in the bar going, yeah, I used to do a lot of amateur musical theatre. I'm sure I could have went on and done it professionally. So I jumped off the cliff and said I'd give it a go for 12 months, and that was 20 years ago. So you need determination. You need We're all serious... glad that you jumped off the cliff, <laughs> Simon. We're all <laughs> delighted because we've been enjoying your career for the last 20 years, and you've really You're brought so much joy um to, to everyone who's watched your performances and i can say safely say that last year you in the snapper was just one of the best pieces of theater i'd seen in a long time and one of the best performances so and god yeah, bless you it was a great right. show it was a great show yeah yeah well you were fantastic in it listen simon you've been an absolute gent here today That's and tough. um yeah thank you so so much for joining us here a on pleasure. stage door live and yeah, I mean, everybody's going to be delighted to take on your uh, advice and there'll be jumping off cliffs left, right and centre. <laughs> I hope so. Follow your dreams, lads. Listen, what's the worst yeah. that can happen? You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, exactly. at the end of the day, you know, at least you can say you gave it a go. But, you know, stick with it. You know, if, if, it, if it's yeah. what you want to do for a living, take it seriously. Treat it like a business. Yeah. Surround yourself with good people. Take as much advice as you can and be prepared to work as hard as you've ever done in your life. I find myself saying this with every guest, but I could have chatted to Simon for hours. We had to edit this interview for our live show, but an extended version will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. If you haven't already, after the show, take a look at our YouTube channel where you'll find all our previous episodes and exclusive content. Subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll be the first one to know when Simon's extended interview is available. It's a treat. Before we meet our next live guests, in our Art in Isolation series, we wanted to focus in on an exciting new musical created by Will Dunleavy and Ben Esdale. I'll hand it over to the lads to tell us more about their process and collaborations. Hi, my name is Will Dunleavy. I'm a Dublin-based writer and theatre maker. I studied English and Drama at Trinity College and I graduated about two years ago. Uh, I just finished a year in the Vineyard Theatre off Broadway in Manhattan as a script reader. I played musical instruments growing up and I really loved singing in choir at school and had bands and stuff. There were three sisters society said were inseparable. Each so beautiful, who could tell which was preferable? Effortlessly elegant and all of them eligible and I was in the mood to do something memorable. You see... And then when I went to uni, I got into theatre sound design, which was really fun, something I'd never done before. But then it sort of merged from doing the sound design stuff, adding in the classical music side and then working on composition. So when Jack and I first talked about doing a musical song cycle together, we were looking for a composer because my musical abilities are fairly limited. Um, and Ben and I were in college together and he was always banging away at the piano in some show or other. So we put together a list of people we thought might be interested in writing music for us. And Ben was at the top of the list and we asked and he wasn't doing anything. So he said he'd write and that's how we started writing together. So I met Will uh, at Trinity. We were in the same class and we did a lot of work together in the Student Drama Society. Uh, I directed a play he wrote, I was in a play he directed and wrote as well and we worked together in quite a lot of projects as we went through those four years and it wasn't until the last year actually really of our time that we thought hang on let's put our two and two together you know you love doing all this musical side of things and I love writing and writing lyrics 
So why don't we just try some things out? And that's kind of just how it started, just as sort of trying things out with no real agenda. And we started looking for a piece to adapt because sometimes with the musical, there's so many things going on, like the music, the dancing, the lyrics, that it's easier just to adapt something because at least you know the story is there and you have something to work from. Uh, so we were looking for something that would be easy to adapt and also that was out of copyright, so it would be free. Um, so I went home and I kind of looked through my bookshelves and I looked at Jane Austen, but they'd all been done before. And I looked at Henry James, but they're very interior and not really very musical. So uh, I got to Dangerous Liaisons then and I thought maybe, and I opened it and I'd forgotten that there was a prologue to the piece. Uh, and I read it and I kind of saw a way in for the adaptation. Uh, and I wrote like a first draft of the opening song um, that day and sent it to Jack and he liked it. And that's how we started working on it. It's quite a mammoth of a text, which I think is why what drew us to it in the first place is it, it is so rich. It's just chock full of amazing stories and drama and intrigue and all literally everything you could want from a musical or a play or any sort of drama artistic thing you know and i do really feel like it spoke to the moment well, it was two years ago now when this happened but i feel like it still speaks to our moment um in terms of like gender and sexual politics uh it is a hard one to adapt and i do find it difficult doing the book as well as the lyrics uh it's usually regarded as like the greatest novel of the 18th century uh, so sometimes when you're trying to unpick it and put it back together again uh, it feels like you're fighting with it rather than adapting it um, and a lot of the time it feels like you're losing <laughs> but it is very rewarding they're amazing amazing characters um and really like compared to their kind of contemporary novels at the time like it's leaps and bounds ahead of where the rest of them are um, will's writing is 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 amazing and the way he's edited this complex really quite complicated story into a musical is really something amazing um but like because of that i think that's what drew us to it that it would be this challenge it would be it's not simple it's not like boy meets girl love story and i think that in this day and age people want people want to go to be challenged by things you know the new musicals that are coming out are a bit more complicated they do push like more complicated subjects like Dear Evan Hansen or something like that that's just come out it deals with things that audiences aren't necessarily comfortable with and I think that's that's really good I think that's really fun not to say that old musicals don't do that but I think people are happy to be challenged in quite a pushing way by something a bit more just intriguing really and intrigue is is a bit of a buzzword for Dangerous Liaisons because it is full of intrigue the music for Dangerous Liaisons has been a real challenge and a real fun one absolutely it is complicated in terms of the text and complicated in terms of the rhythm and all the work that's going on internally for the characters and all this kind of layers of stuff before you even get to the kind of basic music of like what the melody is going to sound like so and setting and uh, historical timing and all those sorts of things you know you have to look at where we are when we are all those different things and mixing genres and thinking how do we how do we write how do we write rap songs that would be sung by French aristocracy at the end of the 18th century? You know, you've got these kind of problems and putting those things together with like a classic piano power ballad is part of what's making this project, I think, really cool and special is that we've, we're, we're not shying away from any of these big challenges, especially in, in the writing from Will and I both. I think we're both taking them kind of head on and seeing what comes out. Um, I don't really like to think of the lyrics as separate from the book, uh, the dialogue of the piece. I just tend to think of them as dialogue that just happens to be rhymed and set to music. Uh, lyrics come first, almost always. It's a bit of a chicken the egg question, and the answer here is the egg. It's the lyrics that come first, usually. Um, but no, that's not to say that the lyrics are set in stone at any point. We, we work really well together organically, kind of creating this symbiosis of lyric and music whereby Will will 
kind of sort of do a first draft and I'll always be kept up to date with the drafts as he's doing them and then he'll send me a draft and he'll say I'm doing some rewrites and I'll write some music and send it on to him. He'll put them to music, he'll send me back the sheet music, oh, I'll have a listen to it. I might have a couple ideas but usually it's excellent so um, there usually aren't many comments and then I might send it back to him with a few notes uh, and then we'll go back and forth for a little bit and that's how we write it to And we've almost always, in fact we have always worked remotely from each other which is kind of hilarious in a way that at certain points he's been in Dublin I've been in London or I've been in Dublin he's been in New York or we we keep meeting in random different little places and having little meetings and then going our separate ways sending things to each other sending things back and reworking this is what I learned if you were to hear a girl the world is concerned they wonder when they tease and they wonder who she'll kiss and they feed on their knees to proceed for a squeeze by the bell please please I didn't quite realise how popular musical theatre is in Ireland. And there's so much, you know, at Trinity, the Musical Theatre Society, which was only like two... In fact, it's, it started when I was there, was huge by the time I left. There were hundreds of people getting involved in their major productions and linking up with theater, musical theatre societies from other universities and just the amount of people and the enthusiasm and fanaticism that comes from musical theatre fans is insane. And, you know, the, the amount of regional musical theatre that goes on and there's so much work being produced and it's really, it is, does form this core of people's theatrical understanding, which I think is incredible. And I think it's really even more incredible the amount of theatres that are willing to programme new musicals and support new musicals. I think people are starting to respect musical theatre more uh, and to respect the integrity of it as a form. Uh, but I don't think Ireland at the moment anyway has the resources or the training structures in place to compete with London or New York in terms of a musical theatre scene. Uh, which is a pity because Irish culture is one that is very heavily grounded in storytelling through music. And there is a huge Irish audience for musicals. I mean, you know, you only have to look at the Borgosh Energy Theatre, which sells thousands of tickets a year for touring productions of, you know, UK musicals to see that people are interested in musical theatre in Ireland. Um, I do think, though, you're seeing a lot more Irish theatre work that, while not necessarily in a classical musical theatre tradition, does incorporate music and dance and text in a way that is more reminiscent of musical theatre. It's so easy to say, let's do a Lloyd Webber or, you know, let's do something that we know, we've seen, it, we can do it. Or And I think that might especially come from this idea of like the TY musical and saying, what can we put on that we can get 30 people in the cast for without having people just standing around because we have to shove them in. You know, there, are there small musicals being created? Are, are there new big musicals being created? And there, there is, a, I know there is, because you know, it's happening. And there definitely is in terms of like opera and things like that. And I think that Danger Liaisons um, will fit really nicely in that kind of, um, that emerging scene, yeah, with the, uh, this kind of new idea of Ireland creating its own musicals. If Lema Mamarada could write all musicals from now on, that would be great. Um... But I do think what Ian nails uh, in Hamilton is that musicals, I think, at their best and what makes them different from opera, um, which they're obviously closely related to, uh, is that musicals are drama set to popular music. Uh, and I think that's what Miranda gets so right with Hamilton. I mean, musicals should sound like what you're hearing on the charts. They are essentially a popular art form. They come from operetta and vaudeville. Um, and I want to hear more musicals that sound like what people listen to on the radio, because that's how people engage with them. Music is such an important part of Irish culture, and I think it should continue to do so. And pushing itself into theatre is a brilliant way of doing that. Um, so, yeah, I think people should just keep writing songs is what it comes down to. And collaborating as well, you know, writing songs with people. Nothing more fun. with us. We love to see contemporary adaptations of classics and we can't wait to see what you guys create next. We have some inside information that they are currently working on a concept album for Dangerous Liaisons and we will let you know when it is released.
Now I am delighted to welcome Brian Burrows, an actor-director known for Beowulf the Blockbuster and Fiona Brown, an actor-singer who can currently be seen in Normal People. Both were cast members in Angela's Ashes the Musical. Welcome to the show, Brian and Fiona. Fiona, how are you keeping? Very well, thanks. Yeah, not too bad. Um, yeah, Brilliant. ups and downs and like everybody about- in lockdown, but... Oh yeah, like us all, like us all, moments of insanity um, and then moments of, yeah, <laughs> normality. Um, yeah. Brian, how are you keeping? Yeah, I'm flying it, thanks. Uh, I, I got to see my family for the first time in months, uh, the weekend just gone, so I'm disproportionately over-emotional about everything at the moment. So it's the perfect time to chat about musicals and Angela's Ashes and stuff, you know? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I'd say that was pretty special. All right. I had the same experience about two weekends ago. And sure. Oh, God, it was amazing just to give Mammy an old hug. Hadn't given Mammy a hug in a few months. So, yeah, very important. Um, Anyway, let's get back to business um, and talk about musical theatre. So, um, Fiona, I'll I'll ask you first, but this question is is for you both. So neither of you are musical theater heads per se so to speak and um, were you ever interested in being in a musical or was it something you never really thought about uh, and what drew you to angela's ashes um i mean I, um yes of course i wanted to be in a musical <laughs> when i was uh uh yeah especially when i was small i loved singing always loved singing always loved performing and my favorite film probably still to this day it, um, is Greece. Um, so there was definitely, uh, you know, that desire there, but I, I couldn't see a way to do it in Ireland. I mean, I was lucky enough to be sent to drama classes, but um, I thought in order to be that type of a performer, you had to go to a- Italia Conti or Sylvia Young in London. And I used to feel very hard done by that. We didn't live in London and I couldn't go to stage school. Um, there wasn't that level of training available here so i guess if you can't see it you can't be it so uh, short of i mean obviously um seeing jacinta white play annie which which i did when i was a child and jacinta who plays <laughs> angela in angela's ashes i i looked at her and but I, I was just like wow how do you do that and um you know so i i suppose i could see it to a certain extent but it wasn't as accessible to me i suppose as a child anyway you know Yes. Mm. Uh, well, then you, you it must have been amazing to be on stage with Jacinta after obviously seeing her as a yeah. child. What a, a wonderful I experience. Had so, so many pinch me moments with that show. But um, the first rehearsal, the first rehearsal where I sing a duet with Jacinta, um, where play best friends, you know, um, and I, I was in the we had a little rehearsal on our own with the musical director and the musical supervisor who were just out of this world to work with um, uh, David Hayes and Mike Dixon and myself and Jacinta. And we just sang through the song for the first time. And I was just like, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It was <laughs> a real, uh, you know, one of those uh, sort of full circle moments that you kind of go, wow, you know, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, so I like enjoyed every bit of it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So Brian, the same to you now. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to Angela's Ashes? And yeah, yeah like, this did is you gas, ever see yourself yeah. in a musical? Hilariously, like uh, musicals were my thing when I was growing up, when I was growing up in Carlo and it was the, the my secondary school, the presentation in Carlo, we did our musicals. And then it was uh, the Dalma Music Society, we did the King and I, and it was just musicals, musicals, musicals. But here's, I'll be devil's advocate here now for musical love and everything, was that I didn't like musicals. I didn't like them. I was like, I don't get these. I don't understand them, but I love being in them. And I'd be saying to my family, they're like, will we come and see your show? It's like, nah, you wouldn't like it. It's grand, but it's great crack being in it. And But that weirdly then led me into the realm where I developed a love for them by the combination of the harmonies of, of different groups, by how it was all put together and the passion that went into it. And so what ended up happening then was I ended up directing musicals then in my secondary school after I'd gone and trained as an actor. And I was in this halfway place where I would say that I, I had a, like developed musical theatre skills, but very much wanted to be, you know, a sort of, I suppose, a, a, a straight actor. But I don't want to say that, like more like an actor in, say, contemporary dramas as opposed to musicals. But the skill set for both fascinatingly overlaps. So I think in the case of Fiona and the rest of us in the cast, 
there was this lovely mix of what you know, would be kind of not necessarily considered musicals actors, but we learned so much from the musicals actors and we hope, you know, vice versa as well. So I had this interesting, it was never a case that I, I hated musicals. It was more, they weren't in my soul the way I can feel they're in the soul of other people who go, no, I love musicals, but they've, they've grown in my heart over time. And I've gone, yeah, these are powerful. These are beautiful. These are stunning. And it might be, I don't know, that more kind of contemporary drama sensibility that made me want to be a part of Angela's Ashes because I thought there was something very dramatic and weighty and heavy there, along with the, the magic and the passion and the humor that's in it as well. You know, there's a long answer for you now. No, but it's a good one. It sounds like uh, musical theater is is firmly in the soul now, Brian. Um, you yeah. know, now that you've been in in Angela's ashes, and and did you find it um, challenging? I'll, I'll go over to you again, Fiona. Did you find it challenging being in a musical, having done a lot of plays um, before that? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I I remember asking. The day before the uh, rehearsal started, I was on holidays, actually flying home from holidays, and I, 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 I had been in touch with the um, with Vincent, the uh, production manager, company manager, to say, "Is there anything I can do while I'm away? I mean, is there anything I can learn? Could they send me some, you know, line tapes to listen to? Have you got anything?" And literally, the the answer we got back from David Hayes, who is just very funny and dry, was just like, "Just." Uh, Come with, uh, you know, thinking on your on your feet. Bring a pencil. Bring sweets. Uh, just be prepared to learn on the fly. And I was like, oh, okay. So I mean that. So from day one, we were going in learning harmonies very fast. Um, you know, I had to really be on my game. You know, because like Brian said, there were seasoned musical theatre performers in the cast. You know, I am an actor slash singer. Um, you know, so I I don't read music. I the book, even though I took one, because I was like, yeah, I'll have one of those, sure. Um, but I don't <laughs> read music, so uh, I'm all by ear. So I recorded everything, and like a lot of us who learn by ear, uh, I learned it that way. But I did my homework every goddamn night. There was so much to to remember <laughs> with that show. Yeah. The movement. So you've got the movement. You've got the 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 songs, intricate harmonies, um, and uh. Yeah, the, the movement alone, that learning that track was was something else. And then on top of that, your 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 acting performance. So yeah, there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of multitasking, I suppose. Yeah, it uh, sounds like you've got a lot of <laughs> a lot of balls juggling in the air there with all of those things you have to yeah. think about. It's completely um, immersive, yeah, well, but it's brilliant. Yeah. It's a brilliant yeah. experience yeah. to do one like that, Absolutely. you know. Yeah, um, fantastic. And and same to you, um, Brian, can you tell us what challenges that, that you faced? All of them. All of the challenges <laughs> you can imagine on a show were in this show. And that, that was what was brilliant about it was that we were essentially 14 performers who had to like fire on all cylinders and upskill enormously to deliver on the promise of the show. And I think it was that we all believed in, the, in it so passionately that that's how it came about. So um, I think I, I'm using this phrase, but you know what I mean? We all had cheat sheets stuffed in our bras throughout the entire <laughs> production because we were in the wings going, what's next, yeah. what's next? This is next, you're next, what's next? And um, it, it was phenomenal and that same as Fiona. I, I don't read music and I was learning, every night you went home, it wasn't like you finished rehearsals and chilled, you went home to absorb everything you'd learned that day because you knew more was coming the next day. And we rehearsed mm -hmm. those scenes to the nth degree, to the point where, and not as a criticism of the show, more an observation, dramatic scenes, scenes where there was acting involved, we got to them kind of in the tech <laughs> because everything else demanded so much time and effort and energy, but it was in the pursuit of that perfect choral moment and in the pursuit of that perfect mm. physical moment and that we all had to bring those skills to bear. So if, if you know, physical theatre is kind of my area, I suppose, you know, where I feel that's my yeah. home. And so anything that required that, I was happy to take and go, I can do that, I'll grab that, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then someone else, you know, particularly, you know, who can hit those high notes, they were assigned that. And even in my case, I'm not a very powerful singer at all. I couldn't sit here and claim, oh, I'm a singer. I love to sing. I'm passionate about singing. 
And I was delighted to be inside this ensemble of brilliant singers. And as Fiona is saying, if I can stand beside Owen Cannon and Jacinta White and hold my harmony along with their powerful voices, my nervous system believes I'm singing like that. <laughs> it tricks me into thinking, well, it's amazing, but it's not me. So I did wonders for the ego, you know, like I, I strut around yeah. the place going, I was in this professional musical, but like, I know what my contribution was. <laughs> And I'm very clear <laughs> where the line is and the limit is, you know. So I'm in awe of the people I was on stage with, you know. They were amazing. amazing. Yeah. Well, it sounds like one of those shows where everyone, you know, has to work together to make it work, you know. Because uh, mm. weren't the harmonies very complex as well for Angela's Ashes? Yeah. Like, didn't you have, like, six-part harmonies and things like that um, oh, yeah, to work on? Oh. Well, hats off to you guys. It sounds it sounds brilliant. So, um, yeah, having had this experience now, that was a little bit scary and a little bit in territory unknown. Um, I'll go. I'll go back to you, Brian. Would you go back and do it again? Would you do another musical? Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I love them. I do. And as much as I think, what what I'd like, I think what I got to bring to the musical was because I inherently don't go. I love musicals, you know, because that's not not me. I fight with it to to in my own soul to make it as compelling as possible to go i have to fall in love with this and make it work for me and nothing was as challenging as that musical hands down the most challenging thing i've ever done and it's a brilliant thing to be inside it's brilliant to be terrified and unsure and not know and trust your skill set to bring you on i mean even in my case i sort of famously came on into the wrong scene as one character in one of the previews ambled on in the, in the wrong costume the wrong character wrong scene and stood my ground thinking Ah, yeah, they'll catch up in a second. I'm saving the show here by giving the, the crew a chance to get themselves in order and slowly realize. And you go, I wasn't expecting this to happen this late in my career, but here we are, you know. So I, I would do another musical in a heartbeat, partly just because I love to sing. And if I can be inside yeah. an ensemble who are brilliantly singing and I'm around them, it's, it's wonderful, you know. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I would do another one. No, no bother. Oh, I've got a great image in my head now, Brian, of you casually just <laughs> sauntering on the stage and then casually just oh. Oh, walking back up again. <laughs> That's just brilliant. It's so shocking. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all had those. Fiona, um, yeah. what about yourself? You uh, Would you go back and uh, go for more? Have you got the musical theatre bug oh, now? Oh, gosh. Absolutely. Yeah, I really have. And um, actually, it was really an education being with um, actors who were really immersed in musical theatre, like um, uh, Michael Joseph and Amanda Minahan and Owen and um, Jacinta, the more seasoned musical theatre performers uh, among us, because I felt I got an education from them. The chat was about musicals. It was like, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Oh, this song would be great for you. And, you know, all of that. So I really felt it. I got a bit of an education from being with those people and for me um the sort of the holy grail of performance is um i i, I like brian i i i started off doing quite physical theater in my youth and but for me the holy grail is being able to combine acting singing and movement and angela's ashes had all of that and 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 um you know i think the type of theater now the the new mu musicals that are emerging um have that and i want more of that <laughs> please thank you universe yeah. <laughs> yeah. well so, it, sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like you're both officially uh triple threats now you know um that term well. where you've got the singing dancing and acting uh going on <laughs> um we have a question from social media now uh knowing and seeing brian perform on stage i am curious to know how he adapted to the realm of musical theater especially after working on a wonderful one-man show beowulf there you go brian yeah sure i mean it's interesting because the, the delight is whilst beowulf was incredibly challenging because it's the one person show the delight in being in an ensemble of 14 other performers you go oh great the weight of this isn't on me entirely but it still took everything I had to do, you know. Um, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And we're interestingly enough, it was the skill set I feel I evolved in Beowulf and kind of physical theatre that very much helped me in my audition because it was multiple characters. And I've never had an audition like that before where normally, I think Fiona would agree, and other actors, you go in, you know, you're battling your nerves, you're holding yourself, and you're going, I hope, I hope, I hope. And instead, for whatever reason in this audition, 
I went in and treated it a bit like, not my one-man show, but because there was a panel of observers, my, my, my nervous system went, oh yeah, I know this. And I just told them what I was going to do and did, did it. I was like, right, for this character, I'm going to do this. And I did this. Then I'm going to do that for this one. And then I was like, okay, hit it with the music there. I'm going to sing this. And I sang this. And I was like, right, great, thanks, folks. And off I went. I came out to the side going, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? So somewhere in there, they went, yeah, him grand. Like somewhere like, yeah, yeah, grand, grand, that, that's fine. And I think, you know, that you come out of those things going, I don't think I was quite myself there. I was definitely up to 90 on something, but that, that, that helped, you know, doing Beowulf going into that, particularly for the, the fast character changes, you know, um, f for just getting involved in that ensemble and having a sense of the overall piece. So both helped each other. Like I'm getting to go back to Beowulf now at the end of the summer. I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm excited about bringing the Angela's Ashes skill set into it. And because I wrote it, I could add a song now. So those things are in there as well. So I can't, you know, one feeds the other and helps the other without, without a doubt, you know. So thanks for that yeah, question, Tara could... Landers, who, who I got to direct in a show in the Prez back in the day when she was Glinda the Good Witch in Wizard of Oz. Tara is a phenomenal performer. So there we go. Oh, well, it sounds like she's still a, a big fan of yours as well, Brian. Um, so, right. yeah, thank you so much to, to both um, Brian and Fiona for joining us this evening. Um, hopefully now there'll be plenty of actors that are inspired to, I suppose, step out of their comfort zone and do what you guys did and, and try musical theatre if they hadn't done so already. So thank you so much for that. It was a really good insight um, into, yeah, trying something new. Thanks, Kelly. Great. Our associate producer Janice de Broyha, who produced this episode, was joined by the lovely Connor Mitchell. Let's take a look. I am joined now by the immeasurably talented Connor Mitchell. The founder and artistic director of the Belfast Ensemble, Connor is one of the most prolific composers and writers to come out of Northern Ireland. He is an established orchestral concert composer and librettist and has been awarded many accolades, including Best Score at the New York Music Theatre Festival, the Styles and Drew Songwriters Award and the Arts Foundation Fellowship Award for Composition, awarded by Sir Richard Eyre, among many others. His work has been presented all over the world from Belfast to London and New York. We're delighted to have you with us today, Connor. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, you too. Thanks very much for coming. Um, so first of all, we'll start off nice and easy. Can you tell me how you found your way into music and theatre? What was your journey? I think that about that quite a lot, actually, because um, I because I straddle both worlds. It's very weird in that my day to day kind of language is music and musicians. So I, I, I spend most of my day thinking about how I write music and stuff like that. But the reality is my tribe is theater people. Um, <laughs> so I suspect lots of people are in that position when we were all very, very young. You were either in the practice room or you were in the rehearsal room. And even though I was a musician, I was always in the rehearsal room. It was mm. the drama and actors and the stage and the rush of the audience and learning lines and telling stories to me was the much more um connective thing really but mm -hmm. being a musician i suppose was, was just my language i mean that was just what i did you know i had aspirations of being an actor and stuff like that but unfortunately <laughs> i'm too i'm too neurotic to be uh, <laughs> looked at by other people so um that that's really what happened so my life basically was a coming together of those two performative planets mm. um and while that is fantastic in that it allows me to work in musical theater and opera and straddle many many different worlds it's also a bit paralyzing because i'm kind of a hermaphrodite <laughs> you know um yeah. because you know the easiest thing to be is in our business is you know the world's best costume designer or the world's best yeah. wig maker or the world's best set designer or lyricist or the world's best person who writes you know musical theater songs in 4-4 what the world finds very odd is people that are easily bored that want to do other things um yeah. and I'm, I'm one of those people so that, that can be 
as bad as it is yeah. good. You've often described yourself as a musical dramatist or music theatre maker. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about your use of those terms and what you mean by that? Um, because I am equally as interested in musical theatre as I am interested in grand opera, contemporary opera and song cycle. I mean, I, I, you know, I have as much fondness for Gilbert and Sullivan as I do yeah. for the works of Thomas Adez. I mean, anything that tells a story that is true to itself, like I love, like I love Calamity Jane. I love Little Shop of Horrors. What I don't like are things that are disingenuous to their form. You know, and God knows I've read enough of them, you know, myself. In my <laughs> um, but all of those are dramatical forms of musical storytelling. And I got, I suppose I got really, really bored with somebody saying, you write musicals or, oh, you write opera. And then this terrible debate of what's the difference between a musical and an opera. And I just got so <laughs> bored of having that conversation again and again that I just went, I'm a dramatist. I just write a lot of music when I do it. So everything that in the world that I create, people tell their stories with music. So I just said, I'm a musical dramatist. Um, I would still call myself that today, but people even have difficulty with that because they, somebody actually once said, to me, but are you an opera musical dramatist or are you a musical <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like there's I an inherent up. need that you have to be one specific thing and you have to be in that box. <laughs> it doesn't happen in America. Like no. in America you have like the composer Nico Mui, who's, you know, a little bit younger than me, uh, kind of an inheritor of the Philip Glass sensibility in the minimalist mm -hmm. world. He has commissions one day with the Met and then the next he's writing a film score and then he's working on an album with Bjork and it's really celebrated. And the Americans love, like Leonard Bernstein was writing, you know, West Side yeah. Story as we know and then the next day yeah. he was writing, you know, a piece for the LA Phil. And in America that's, that's wonderful. They, they love the invention of that, but in the UK and Ireland, it's, they, they find that very, very, very odd. You know, they, people use this phrase, jack of all trades, master of none, and that pisses the mm. shit out of me, you know, because it doesn't yeah. take into consideration the huge amount of work that has to happen in theatre these days. Mm. Um, also, I suppose it's a, little, that, it's a little bit untruthful really, isn't it, to, to have, to say that because like show me a theatre maker who hasn't done more than one job. Do you oh, know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And also yeah. it's, you know, we've been doing it since time in memoriam. You know, there is a reason we say Renaissance man. Mm. You know, uh, we have, I think in, in the theatre had men and women that were actors and producers and script writers, you know, dramatists and costume makers on the road driving the van, raising the money, selling the tickets, making the cups of tea, being Cleopatra, then, you know, out the back, moving on to the next show. That's how we worked for years and years and years. Like the, the scope of your work is incredible, right? You, you orchestra, opera, musical scores, everything. When you sit down to write, what's your starting point? Like what makes one story, this is gonna be an opera or this is gonna be a musical or does it sort of reveal itself? as you write? No, nothing ever reveals itself as I write. <laughs> um, ever. <laughs> uh, I, um, I generally envisage the end point of something before I start, you know, and I mean the end, like people leaving the auditorium or leaving the theater. Mm. Um, or the concert hall, or pressing, you know, stop on a recording. I, I know what subject I'm going to write about, and I know the context. Uh, so, I always try and imagine the end point. So, like, if someone's leaving the auditorium, what do I want them to feel? Do I want them to feel they've just watched this epic thing that had to have a symphony orchestra? Or do I want them to be totally uplifted and go, oh my God, I've watched this tiny story with a huge jazz band. And I try and imagine the spell that's happening in an auditorium and then I kind of work backwards. 
and then I plan the whole thing out to structures. So then I just fill in that. But there's always a very, very, very worked out structure. I would never um, start on page one and just see how it goes. That would frighten the life yeah. out of me. Like I cannot bear <laughs> improvising. Yeah, oh, really? <laughs> I, oh, I can't. Bear. There's a composer over here called Brian Irvine, who is um, like, he's a total genius. He's, he's an amazing composer. But he has passages where he just writes improvise for 12 bars. And I, I would have a no. I would have a nosebleed at that because of the lack of control. <laughs> when you sit down to write, where where does your inspiration come from? Where do the melodies come from? Like, do you, like you've talked about, you know, kind of what you you think about the audience leaving and what feeling they want. But when you sit down at your keyboard or with your pencil or whatever, where does that inspiration come from? Is it is it text, lyrics, notes? Well, they're all they're all different for different things. So if you're writing, mm. let's say, a contemporary opera, mm. um, or let's say the piece that I'm writing at the minute, which is uh, Latin liturgical mass, but I mean it's for the Ulster Orchestra. So I'm, what I'm taking is the Latin mass, uh, so the Kyrie, the Gloria, and all those things, yeah. and then I'm infusing, I think, the Russian. Uh, pre being jailed rap of pussy riot so oh my God, think amazing. That's going to be layered over the orchestra with four opera singers <laughs> and a choir um and that's for a big queer festival in belfast with the Ulster orchestra and you know digital projection in those cases the text must exist first mm. and likewise in a contemporary opera the text would exist first and then i respond purely musically um, because I have much more freedom with the words and I have to create an internal musical life to each syllable. So a single syllable can be wrapped, you know, in a hundred notes. Whereas in a musical, it's a slightly different process. Musical settings of words are usually monosyllabic, mostly, and they're conversational. So the music is a slave in that instance to the meter of the lyrics and in those instances I write music and lyrics at exactly the same time. Um, I've never set music to a musical theatre lyric that I've already written. Because you, like, you've worked with Mark Ravenhill haven't you? So how does yes. that process work? In each of those instances we were driving Mark to like to get the libretti finished first and then I would mm. respond. Um, gotcha. We're in the case of Ten Plagues which is basically 16 poems. Mark wrote 16 poems and then I found a way to create song structures out of the poems, in a, but in a very mm. Schubert kind of way. Yeah. So I went back to the old models, Schubert and Winterreise and all of those. Um, and in a way, I suppose all the classical stuff is easier to qualify because it is very text and then the music sits on top of it and then your the form is you know responding to the king music but in musical theater it's it's very very different in musical mm. theater you can start a song and you can say you know you lock down your structure and the character beats within that and where you know one character must have dominance mm. and one must be subservient and you push your numbers in to that kind of structure. Like I use a lot of post-it notes <laughs> and I'll have a really massive post-it note and I'll say, right, that's the number. In the first 10 minutes, first 20 minutes, that's the number that needs to be yeah. dominant. Um, and I might start with like one line or what you'd call the gestus of that song. Uh, you know, like in the musical that you worked on, Have a Nice Life, there's a song called yeah. Old Fashioned Romance. So <gasps> the only lyric I knew but the only lyric I knew when I sat down to write that was an old fashioned romance. Romance, yeah. And then you just keep going in a kind of cold porter sensibility. Start yeah. with the last line and then list the song through and yeah. something will come. But that's the way Steve Sondheim writes. Um, and it's how you come up with the most conversational off the cuff human lyrics. Um, Absolutely. And can, can you tell me about your connection with Sondheim? Have a Nice Life, our group, as it's now called, did a yeah. brief stint in New York. And um, word of my work had kind of filtered through to Steve. And 
he ended up being invited to see, to see it. And I remember he was sat in a, he turned up and he was in a few rows in front of me and I was being terribly Irish at the back saying, I, of course I could never introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a very brusque kind of New York choreographer who literally lifted me by the collar and pushed me. That's Stephen Sondheim. Literally pushed me. Oh. And I ended up saying, oh, hell, oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Sondheim. I've been impersonating you for years. Uh, and um, I kind of got to know him through that. But um, it, it was, it's, yeah, it's more of a, like, you're just knowing a person. And I think... He wouldn't have mentored me in any way because that's not what Steve does. I think he's very generous in just giving people his time and letting them into Ooh. his orbit. I I spent years thinking I was the next Stephen Sondheim. And then I think when what? I was close to maybe becoming something like that, it freaked me out. I, I don't want to be the next Stephen Sondheim. I want to be like the next Connor Mitchell. So yeah. that was a... But actually, he would be the first person to congratulate you for that. What advice would you give to anybody watching now who'd love to be a, a music theatre maker um, as yourself in the future? I think it's finding your tribe. Mm. You know, that is the most difficult thing to do. If you decide you want to um, create shows, and I mean whether that be opera or musical theatre, um, just shows that happen on a stage, so outside of a pit, you know, so that are going to involve actors and, you know, director will come in and it will have lights and you want to create a certain spell in an auditorium. You really need a tribe that's going to support you in that vision. You know, mm. you cannot do that by yourself. You know, so it's pushing in any direction you can to find similar voices and people that have a similar lost to get that thing happening if you have to find them in a bloody bar go to the bar to get them you know <laughs> yeah. but theater people are brilliant like that mm. like every theater person is at their heart somebody who ran away to join the circus <clears throat> i mean they just are they just are yeah. we all have the same story we were all in school and we were all these extroverted little children who you know jumped out from behind the sofa and went boo you know and something happened in our early teenage years and we all started getting trains to the capital city and being in new theatres and then we suddenly all had this different group of friends than our school friends. And then we all graduated to these cities and then we all found ourselves in bars and fringe theatres and at the Edinburgh Festival and then we were all at the National Theatre and all this crap, you know. But we're still children who ran away to join the circus. Uh, so theatre people meet other theatre people and I would say run to that totally Ooh. run to that sensibility because the theater gang is there for life it will change and people will come and go and friends will go but theater people is theater people so find that network of like-minded people who are willing to sleep on the streets of edinburgh to get a show up <laughs> you know or are willing to put to do a show for 50 quid a year you know that's how you start um Either you can, you know, run to that or you can be timid. And I would say run to it. And if somebody wants to put on new work, support them. Not all new work will work. You know, it generally takes a writer until their 40s. It took Beethoven until his 40s to really solidify his sound. Steve Sondheim was writing company at, like, what, 41? You know, um... People have to go through their 20s and their 30s and find who they are and make all their mistakes and piss everyone off and then find their voice. And I think just do it all together as a group. Yeah. You know, that is, and you will that, come out the other side. That is incredible advice. I feel really inspired now having heard you say that because, you know, to think, God, you know, there's time yet, there's hope yet, you know, the, the best work ahead of me, you know. <laughs> there is. Look, all of this coronavirus stuff will pass. Theatre people yeah. have survived the great plague. Music and theatre find a way to squeeze out, you know, they do, they will all, yeah. oh, you cannot suppress it. Because every day there's another child born who is jumping from the back of a sofa shouting boo to their parents. Yeah. You just cannot fight that instinct. Yeah. Connor, that's all the questions I have. Um, thank you this so is... much. 
Yeah, it is as, as happy as yeah. I would be to to sit and talk to you for hours more. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to me today and uh, some brilliant advice there at the end there. Thank you so much. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you. I've got my love to Carlo. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. We'll provide a link to Connor's website and his work with Belfast Children's Festival in the show's description later tonight. As is always the case with our recorded interviews, we had to edit this interview for our live show. Janice chatted with Connor for almost an hour. The extended version will be available on our YouTube channel in the next few weeks. We have come to our final guest of the evening and what a treat it is to introduce Oscar and his dad, Brian Gilligan. Brian has had an illustrious career as a musical theatre performer throughout Ireland and the UK. Most recently, the UK and Ireland tour of The Lion King. Welcome to the show, Brian and Oscar, making your live TV debut. Hi Kelly, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. It's great to be on. It's lovely to have you on. Um, so Brian, when you were starting out, was the dream always London? Um, and was it hard to take that leap? It yeah, it was hard to take the leap. I I, I kind of spent an awful lot of time between studying and being involved in amateur uh, um, musical theatre groups and being involved in music as a singer and uh, as a musician in Ireland. And I, I'd originally been training to be a secondary school music teacher. I'd, um, I'd uh, come out of Trinity College after PGCE year, uh, planning to go into secondary school uh, teaching work. But the kind of the, the other part of me was saying, why don't you just take a, a bit of a plunge in uh, music full time? and during my final year, um, an, an opportunity came up to audition for a show in London. I'd flown back over twice or three times and knowing that that was always going to be the plan and the, the, the biggest thing that was going to be on the horizon for me, uh, I wanted to go and chase that and pursue it. And uh, I ended up in, in the commitments on, on the West End in London. And uh, since 2013, it's just been a whirlwind. It's been amazing. And uh, yeah, I've, I, I, I kind of... Uh, in a way, I haven't really looked back, and I've been uh, I've, I've been very fortunate to, to to get to work in London and to get to live what's been a dream since I was the age of four. Amazing. Well, it takes a you know a very brave person to take that leap, and you did it so successfully. So that's that's amazing. Um. So yeah, the skills and energy required to do those big shows that you're doing night after night. It must be quite intense. Can can you tell me about that and how you mind yourself? Because that's important too. Yeah. So for the eight show week in the in 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 the in, in the west ends for for people who were involved in those shows and um i mean i suppose for 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 anybody who's kind of like trying to get to like a really really high professional standard level particularly in the musical theater and look i mean any 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 kind of area of the industry any any kind of like specific craft and um, the biggest thing that that, that anybody is going to do to mind themselves is that they're going to you know, work out as much as they can in the week. Watch they eat. Watch what they eat. Watch what they drink. Watch what they consume. And um, some of the time, it depends on the role. It depends on what shape you've got to be in. It depends on the the kind of the director's image. What 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 they have in mind for you. And um, yeah, an awful lot of it is just down to that kind of personal decision making, and you have to adapt to a specific lifestyle. Like I, I remember when I went on tour for the first time with the commitments. Um, for a role that's literally the the kind of like the slob all drinking all eating deco the soul man cook the ironic thing was that in the background i i had to be in the gym every day i had to steam i had to be you know lemon honey and ginger uh, uh hot teas everywhere i went uh i couldn't go so out you were, with the cat. would have liked you to, were the but, opposite you, know. you were the opposite <laughs> yeah, to your yeah. character that's hilarious oh my god wow yeah that's fascinating yeah yeah uh, literally as as Killian Donnelly who played it before me said you've got to live like a monk 
you know, in your <laughs> in your ecclesiastical monastery, you know, prepping all your meals and sleeping until ten, and you know, meditating and uh, <laughs> taking taking in the beams of the sun as like your 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 source of uh, protonic energy, and <laughs> you know, no booze, no no party, no social life, but once every four, four months, absolutely mental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to make up for it. Okay, once once in a blue moon, that's good. Um, so yeah, yeah that's good. you've been in some of the biggest global commercial shows going, uh, The Lion King, for example, and then there's a show like Jimmy's, Jimmy's Hall at the Abbey. What were the differences between those kinds of shows, and if any, and uh, do you have a preference? That that's such a class question, actually, because I get I, I it, like it's been a really really great year because I've been asked so many questions about the Lion King by so many different people and out of the, the industry and people who've grown up with the Lion King and people who kind of associate with that massive Disney element in their life that you know is 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 um you know it's 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 been twenty years in existence and to be involved in the in the the, the stage adaptation of it is one of those things that parting it you never know what to expect. But that, that that show, the amount of heart and the amount of kind of passion and energy and level of thought and level of cr creative, um, you know, uh, uh, intuition that goes into really thinking about this for the for the twentieth year or for the God knows how many times some of these people have been on stage with it, it's the same degree of of, of passion and love and um, you know, uh, kind of articulation of detail that that went into Jimmy's Hall, you know. Um, you, you've just you've you've got two completely different teams in in Jimmy's Hall and the Lion King. You know you're trying to achieve different stories and different narratives, but it's it's that level of chemistry of kind of camaraderie and the coming togetherness of it that's absolutely fantastic. And the fact that you know uh, that that the Jimmy's Hall was a a politics where we had you know where we had to really really kind of deliver a message that was. A lot of subtextual layers of, you know, the problems of uh, direct provision in the country. Uh, the fact that a man was deported illegally from his own country, um, be because of the because of the fact that even though he was uh, a socialist and in some people's eyes a communist, and at least he was kind of viewed that way by the Irish government at the time, it looked as if he was trying to dismantle the the, the fabric. But the, that fabric was being the fact that. De Valera had gotten into bed with the uh, with the Catholic Church and was basically kind of going about his um you know his agenda of mass manipulation to keep everything in line and for his idea and his view of national you know the whole kind of nationalist Ireland that he was trying to achieve. So when you've got so many different uh, components of each story, um whether it's the Lion King or whether it's Jimmy's Hall, you know there there's an awful lot of kind of uh, effort and interpretation that you've got to give to your characters like playing Scar and Pummet in The Lion King and then playing a Republican Tommy Gilroy in Jimmy's Heart Cry from each other. But it is a wonderful, Absolutely. it's a wonderful, wonderful thing because it kind of challenges you as, you know, a, a straight theatre actor, musician. It's like puppetry skills, a high level of of, uh, of, of, uh, of vocals, um, you know, as well as, um, you know, trying to be on a stage with multiple moving parts and... You know, and 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 it was it, it's just um it's it's hilarious when you look at the differences between the two. But the one thing that really really makes them both similar um is, is the fact that there there is so much heart in both of those shows, and what you set out to achieve is pretty extraordinary. You know. Yeah, Oscar is agreeing with you there, Brian. He's agreeing. He's getting very passionate about this topic. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. So, um, would you like to see more Irish musicals, Brian? Do you think there's a place for Irish musicals? Uh, yeah, I do. I, 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 I think that it's a pity that the that that you know, for a country that produces so much incredible talent, whether it's singers, writers, actors, uh, poets, uh, people, people in so many different strands of our of our arts industry. That, Musical theatre kind of get the, the the type of treatment that it deserves, you know the the kind of the the, the recognition that it gets and the acknowledgement, um, kind of comes from the the the, the amateur musical uh, theatre world as a means of where a lot of people would start and where a lot of people had to train before a lot of these third level kind of you know bachelor of musical theatre degrees would have started, 
um, and 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 that's and that's wonderful. There's a sense of community there, particularly in the Associated Irish Musical Society world, that you literally wouldn't get anywhere else. So you get to get up, you get to have a fantastic element of kind of uh, social life, but you also get to learn some pretty awesome shows and get to work with some fantastic people. However, when you put that into the professional sphere, the the fact that people are are you know are are coming together to produce such incredible work like Angela's Ashes the musical like Michael Collins the musical like Breakfast on Pluto and you've got these incredible companies it's a pity when you sit when when you kind of have to take a bit of a back step and say why isn't there a musical theatre industry here why isn't there a couple of rep theatres that can produce new Irish musical theatre works have all of these musical theatre voices come together and have like graduates and new performers rising stars or seasoned professionals who are Irish who had to emigrate to go to London to perform, come back to their home and put on these productions and actually show our country and, and bring a bit of kind of, you know, uh, like raise awareness for the fact that this is such a, a significant, that this is an really important, that that isn't just about kind of breaking out into song or flash mobs. It, it's got substance, it's got content that really speaks for itself. And there's a and there's something about musicals that really drives narratives of specific stories and depicts characters and interprets them that maybe you wouldn't necessarily find in other art forms. So you know, I I, I think it's definitely something that you know Ireland could kind of slightly get its act together on. Yeah, you're so right. We should be asking those questions. You know, why isn't there a program here when we have the talent and we have, you know, the people and we have we have um, a community that absolutely adores going to see musical theatre. So we have the audience. So I think you're right. I think it's about time we pull our socks up on that front and see if we can get something going. So uh, hopefully there's someone watching tonight who go, hmm, maybe I'll set up a musical theatre school in Ireland. <laughs> uh, that would be great. Um, so yeah, um, Brian, I hear that you're also giving some singing lessons at the moment. So uh, how would one go about signing up for those if they wanted to reach uh, for those West End high notes? <laughs> um, well, look, I mean, uh, I, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm teaching online voice lessons all through Zoom. Um, the email is voxroomsdublin at gmail.com. And it's been a pretty interesting year because um, upon accepting the Lion King tour, I'd also been training at Voice College London, who are a wonderful team led by a woman called Rhea Keen. And I'm actually saying this because there's an awful lot of people that want to train as contemporary vocal coaches and teachers. And um, there's an awful lot of people, even even in the acting profession, that might want to do like kind of taster courses and find out more about the voice because it's our it's it's our internal instrument that we use to communicate. We need it. We need to keep it healthy. And for singers, it's one of those things that I well, as a singer myself, I was saying I want to go into teaching, but I'm not 100 percent sure how I go about this. College London were amazing to me. Um, sorry, I'm just swapping shoulders. <laughs> um, <laughs> Very yeah, important. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the the confidence that they gave me to go out um to 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 take on a few students has been just just immense, and I've learned so much from them. It's knowledge that I want to pass on for contemporary and musical theatre singers for people who are aspiring to get into this as a profession, um because we are going to get through this pandemic. It's not going to last long. You know, arts is such an important thing in 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 the country, and. I'm glad to be able to come back and set this up so people can learn in the comfort of their own home and not feel like they've got to travel, not to worry about COVID, how the how the virus is uh, being transmitted or spread. And um, so, yeah, if anybody fancies singing lessons, please uh, drop me an email. It'd be great to talk to you, and I'd love to work with you. And we're networking. We're 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 making friends. As they say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you something, Brian. If anyone wants to learn from the best, they will absolutely have to go to you. Uh, because you are an absolute uh, pro and legend within the industry already and you're only just starting by the sounds of it um, and you know it's been fantastic having both yourself and gorgeous Oscar who's also uh, I'd say might follow in his dad's footsteps because he's an absolute pro uh, on the screen um, so yeah. thank you I mean, both. I mean by the look of it he could be he could be a second row for Leinster rugby and I wouldn't be complaining about that because he's a good player <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to have a couple of different interests within the family isn't it it's good to have you know the musical uh theater side and the sports side so a lovely yeah, uh yeah an array of talents in under your roof that's fantastic thank you so much that's for right. joining us brian 
And I'll let you get back to your very important dad duties. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Have a lovely evening. Take care. You too. If you find value in Stage Door Live, please help us grow by letting your friends and followers know. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that follow button and give us a like. Take a moment to share this live feed with your friends and followers right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and click that bell to keep updated on our new and exclusive YouTube content. Creating live content is a costly endeavor. If you'd like to help us keep the conversations going, please hop on over to our Patreon page, where you can become a patron and gain access to exclusive patron-only content. Patreon.com forward slash theatermakerie. You can find us on most social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at theatermakerie. And catch additional news, blogs, and sector coverage on our website, theatermaker.ie Watch this space there's more exciting content on the way from theatermaker.ie It's quite difficult when every member of your team is a theatre maker but that is also what makes our team here at theatremaker.ie special. We have a vested interest in the well-being of the theatre sector and the promotion of Irish theatre throughout the world. We don't now, nor will we ever, properly review theatre. After all, it is our friends, our colleagues and our collaborators out there pounding the pavement, making theatre every day. Now, from time to time, we may express our opinion about production, or one of our associate producers may blog about a production that really moved them. Theatre makers may quote us, it's been done several times already, but we just aren't in the business of critiquing work. We're supposed to have a big opinion or thought about the industry in the last word. At least that's the format that we've come up with for Stage Door Live. But we found something special instead that we wanted to share. We have an internal policy here that we generally try not to self-promote. And when we do, we disclose the fact that one of our team members is involved in whatever we're discussing. Janice de Broja, our associate producer here at Stage Door Live, was the associate producer on tonight's show. And Janice loves musical theatre. She lives and breathes musicals. It's why tonight's show has been a long one. Janice wanted to make sure we did musical theatre right. Last year, Janice workshopped and premiered a musical that she wrote with Chris O'Sullivan. And we wanted to say thank you for her hard work by taking you behind the scenes of the process. Let's take a look. I remember him looking around the cove, whistling to himself as he did so and then breaking out into that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Um, I decided very quickly that I wanted to do Treasure Island. I picked Treasure Island because I love pirates. Um, they're just they're just cool and they're good fun, and I thought it would be a good fun show to do. That's when the idea kind of came in. So well, why don't we go the whole hog and make this a, a completely original show? Terrifying prospect. <laughs>
easy one to sing, it's an easy one to remember. <laughs> oh, shit! I suppose one of, one of those goals in, in, in life that you, you put out there, you know, this where do you see yourself in five years' time kind of thing, you know, and write a musical was one of those one of those goals. Uh, little did I know that it'll actually come to fruition. But Chris convinced me um, that we could do it, and um, I said, okay, I'm going to trust you, and I'm really glad I did. It's the best decision I ever made. Shh. Hashtag. That was marvellous. Uh, well, that's it for us here at Stage Door Live. Next week, we are focusing on well-being for theatre makers, a much needed topic of discussion in these turbulent times. We usually end Stage Door Live with a poem, but we couldn't end a show about musical theatre with just a poem. We needed to take another break from our format to really end it properly. Here to leave us with a musical treat is Amy O'Dwyer, Amy graduated with a distinction from the London School of Musical Theatre and studied a BA in Drama and Theatre at Trinity College Dublin. When not acting, she works as a producer with the podcast studios and has worked in radio as a newsreader and presenter. You'll be able to see Amy at the new theatre in Jackie by Gerard Humphreys from the 22nd of September to the 9th of October. Here's Amy performing Out of My Head by Cumin and Diamond, recorded at the podcast studios. Good night, everyone, and we'll see you next week at 7 p.m. I live my life in daydreams Avoiding what was real when you're lost in daydreams You never have to feel Distance was my comfort I left the world behind Found safety in illusion Escaped in my mind But your eyes convinced me that I was wrong somehow In them I saw the beauty of living here and now You brought me out of my head for a while So out of my head for just a little while Now I'm lying in bed and watching you smile You brought me out of my head to a brilliant world I couldn't see but I should have seen the signs right there in front of me cause a heart that is truly awake is a heart that can easily break now I'm out of my head for a while so out of my head for 
just a little while Now I'm lying in bed And missing your smile I'll be out of my head I live my life in daydreams Avoiding what was real When you're lost in daydreams You never have to feel 